Hello everyone, this is Eric from the Lakeside Gamer. I've had a lot of people asking about strategy videos for the board game Hegemony since I've created lots of rules videos and done a lot of gameplay that I've posted. So uh, this is what I've gathered so far in terms of strategies that I think would be effective for the different classes. Uh, if you have other ideas of strategies or have seen other things that have been effective, go ahead and drop uh, some comments and ideas that we could share with one another so that uh, players can get a better sense of how to play this game, uh, particularly with four different factions that play very differently. So I'm going to split this into five parts. The first part is going to be general strategies that can be used by the different factions. And then after that, I will go through each of the four factions in turn. Generally, the different classes in hegemony should always consider the impact of elections. Elections matter in this game. Now, when I get into the each individual class, I'll discuss which of the policies I think are the highest priority for the different classes. But no matter what, being able to sway elections in your favor is a good thing and I would say a critical thing for players to consider. So whatever a player can do to increase their ability to win elections, whether that is proposing the bills that they want to pass, whether that is putting more of their color cubes into the election bag or getting influence so that they can influence those elections, that is all going to be very important for the players in the game. Second, uh, when it comes to the actions that players take, obviously you want to make the most efficient actions that you can, and that will take practice with the various cards and combinations and just seeing what will work. But the one thing that you absolutely want to do, no matter what the cards you are using, is consider first which actions might be influenced by other players. For example, as I just stated, uh, in elections, you want to have the elections go in your favor, so you want to propose bills that will be beneficial to you. So if you want to propose a bill, you want to get on that as quick as you can. Because, for example, if the working class player wants the labor market at A, and the capitalist player wants the labor market at C, if one of them proposes the bill, the other one cannot propose a bill for the rest of the round. So uh, they want to make sure they get that done. I've had a few situations already where I've had bills that I wanted to propose that I intended to do in the next card play, but because I chose something else first, another faction proposed a bill in that same uh, on that same policy so I was unable to do so. So consider that and prioritize which bills are most important and get those election proposals out first. If there are any other situations where a player and their actions might impact your ability to do something, do not wait on those actions. Get them done. Uh, as quick as you can, and then you can save the actions that aren't dependent on other players till later in the round. The last recommendation I would give for all players is to play the long game. Uh, there are cards that get you some points immediately, but they don't fit with a long-term strategy. Uh, this is a game where the moves that you make early on can build to get you lots of money or lots of points later in the game, or you can uh, do things that can get you a few points now, but aren't working to toward an overarching strategy. So uh, think big picture with what you're doing. And as I go into the each of the four uh, different classes uh, now, I can uh, give you some ideas of what might be good strategies for each of the four teams. I've split up the four different classes uh, with three things that I would prioritize each. 
One would be ways to go about trying to get victory points, which is ultimately what you're trying to do to win. Second would be elections and what I would pro focus on when it comes to the elections for each of the classes. And finally, just one other general principle that I am going to consider and something that I will pursue with each of the classes. Starting with the capitalist class, uh, the way that I am going to try to pursue victory points is a combination of trying to build up companies and particularly try to make money with exports. So there are other ways to make money. You can sell to other players, but that is going to be dependent on them buying from you. If they buy from you, you'll often make a little bit more money than you would on exports. But the thing that I can control is if I get a whole bunch of each of the four goods that I can uh, purchase or that can be purchased by the other teams. So if I get food, luxury, healthcare, and education companies, if I can sell all four on the export market, I can make as many transactions as I can from the card. The goal would be to get enough goods to make all eight transactions, and then you'll be able to get a whole bunch of money uh, as you go along. If you're able to do more than one turn where you do exports, you're going to get a lot of extra money as you go along. So uh, for elections, I am going to focus first of all on taxation as the capitalist player and second of all on the labor market. You're trying to maximize your revenues and profits and minimize your expenses. The taxation uh, policy is going to be uh, magnified throughout both types of taxes for the uh, capitalist player. You have to pay uh, taxes for your businesses and you have to pay taxes on the amount of money that you make on your revenue. So if you lower those taxes uh, and you get it all the way to C, uh, your tax multiplier will move uh, from the starting point of five all the way down to one, even if the uh, the working class player is able to get their the goods, healthcare and education all the way to A, uh, you still only pay it a very low tax uh, with the multiplier of one. So it is a high, high priority to get taxes to letter C. Uh, also, labor market is going to impact you greatly because the more companies you have, uh, the more you have to pay each worker. So the higher the uh, cost of those workers, the less money you're going to get to keep in any given round. So uh, that can end up costing five or 10 more per business in a round. And the more businesses you have, the more expensive that gets. So that would be the second priority I would have for the capitalist class. And then finally, uh, another thing I've noticed is for the capitalist player, when you're in round uh, five, uh, at that point, you, you need to maximize absolutely maximize your money. You're going to pay your taxes before you do elections. So the, the tax is irrelevant at that point, uh, cha any changes of taxation, as well as um, any change in labor market policy. So instead of focusing on getting more influence cubes or cubes in the bag or proposing bills in round five, do everything you can to make more money. So that can be business deals. That could be more exports. Uh, it could be other things that you can do to make the most money. For the working class, the two major ways to get victory points are trade unions and prosperity. Uh, prosperity is a good thing to pursue, but if I'm prioritizing, I am going after trade unions first. And as a side effect, I'm going to be gaining prosperity along the way. What do I mean? So let's link this then with my second recommendation for elections, and that is education to me is the top priority for the working class. Yes, they also want higher wages through the labor market, and they also want to be able to buy goods cheaply on the foreign market. So those three are all important. But the reason I say education is the highest priority is that workers oftentimes are going to need skilled workers to be able to actually go and work for the different businesses, whether it is 
uh, working uh, for the capitalist class or working for the um, middle class or the state, they are going to need to have those upgraded skilled workers. Additionally, as you get more skilled workers and you have four workers working in the various types of businesses, then having an additional skilled worker allows you to make that trade union. Okay, so if you prioritize that trade union, it will have that benefit. Along the way, as you are developing your workers toward the trade unions, you are also gaining in prosperity as you use your education to get skilled workers is going to be most beneficial because you'll get unskilled workers every round regardless of what you do. So getting education to me is going to be the main focus. And as you develop more trade unions, you first of all get more victory points, uh, two per round. And during the production phase, you get more influence which uh, it goes to what I was saying at the beginning of this video where you want to influence the elections in your favor. And then once you make great strides in getting trade unions, then you can focus more on getting more luxury to upgrade your prosperity more or uh, focus in on getting even more workers to increase your health care or well, use the health care to get more workers so that you can increase your victory points that way as well. So again, education is top priority. Second priority for elections is going to be wages. Uh, and the, uh, this is obvious. You want more money. Uh, if you have more money available, that allows you to buy the goods and services you need uh, along the way. Though, um, if you're not using it specifically for goods and services, uh, having 150 at the end of the game is good for victory points. But anything beyond that is... Uh, is just extra. So prioritizing the money over having the upgrades in the trade unions is actually going to, uh, it's, it's going to end up being a loss in terms of what you would get. Hoarding money isn't helpful for the working class player. The money is there to be used. And if you have some at the end of the game, that's an extra bonus. Uh, but a lot of that can come from what you're paid in the last round. Um, and then when it comes to the trade market, the foreign trade market. The reason I put that as another priority is if you lower the tariff uh, and make it so it's non-existent, if you lower the trade market, food only costs 10. So when you have to cover needs, uh, you could buy it from the foreign trade market or you could drive the capitalist and middle-class player to lower their prices, getting cheaper food from them. Uh, the reason I say this is I've noticed as I played this game that the capitalist player has to pay out a lot of money to the working class for the workers, but they make a lot of it back during the cover needs section of the of, of the round. And if you as the working class player get paid by the capitalists and then you don't give them money back, but instead uh, give that money to the foreign market, it really stifles the amount of money they actually have uh, in profit at the end of the round. So that is going to be important as well to slow down particularly the capitalist class if they are the ones who are winning. Now, if you're concerned about other classes, then you're not worried as much about the foreign trade market. And I would definitely still say education should go before the foreign trade market, but it is something to consider if you're playing the working class and the capitalist is the one that is uh, the one that's of most concern to you. You can really throw a wrench in their plans by taking away their revenue from the cover needs phase with the foreign trade market. Lastly, with the working class, uh, I would say that don't uh, forget that you have active tools that you can use if other uh, classes are pulling ahead. So you've got strikes and you've got demonstrations that you can use to stop production and also to help yourself uh, and get, get extra tools to help you. So if you're in a situation where you will benefit the most by using those tools, uh, do that. Or if even though you won't benefit a ton from it, it will really stop the other player from making progress and they're the one in your way, 
Use it. Use a strike. Slow them down. You might not get as much from it, but they will really not get as much from it. And maybe then they will have to raise their wages so you get to get paid more uh, to help you make the money that you need and slow them down. Uh, and again, that foreign trade market can be used in the, with the same principle. So those are the things I would do with the working class. For the middle class player, the ways that I would approach trying to get victory points would be, first of all, to try to get fully operational companies, which are the companies that have uh, workers in both slots. So the middle class companies, some of them are unique uh, compared to the other companies in that you can staff them with one middle class worker, but then in parentheses, they'll have it where one working class worker could also work. Uh, you don't have to have it, but uh, that that is present. You want those working class workers to be in the company because then they're fully operational. And if you have more fully operational companies than you do prosperity, you will get to move your prosperity up uh, when you get toward the end of the round um, and get, therefore, extra victory points from that. So fully operational companies are huge. Also, prosperity is a way to make a lot of um, victory points uh, quickly with the middle class. Unlike the working class where they can only increase prosperity from buying from other companies, the middle class player has the this wonderful benefit of if they buy from themselves, they're paying themselves so they get those goods for free. So if you produce the goods and you use them to increase your prosperity, that means that you don't have to pay all the extra money to do it. So that would be something you could do. I've seen the middle class player stack uh, turns three or four in a row where they get a bunch of prosperity uh, and they are able to uh, increase their victory point total a lot, even in one round. Now, this won't be the first round this happens, but as I said earlier, playing the long game, you can set yourself up to get lots and lots of points through the victory points. For elections, first of all, uh, along the lines of what I just said, the way that you can stack those victory points through uh, the increase in prosperity is going to be to keep your immigration low. So first priority for me as a middle class would be to keep that low. So uh, immigration, the seventh policy, kind of just an extra there for the other classes. But for the middle class, you want to keep it low. You don't want to have unemployed workers. Uh, having more workers is good. Uh, so that you can staff your own companies. But the reality is you don't need to get three or four companies every single round, so you don't need excess workers. The fact that in a round, even if the immigration is zero, you get one skilled worker of your choice and an unskilled worker, uh, that should be sufficient to, uh, to uh, staff a full company each round. Now, if you want more workers to staff more companies and you want to get uh, two or three companies in the first couple rounds, by all means, you can leave the immigration uh, policy at one or even uh, bump it up to two. But consider again, prosperity. If you increase prosperity, you get more victory points. So the lower your population is, the easier and quicker it will be to increase the prosperity. So if you slow down that immigration, that allows you to get more goods under your belt to make it so that you can make the most points possible. For the other election priorities, at the end of the game, you want to have those uh, th those different policies at B. So um, the, the first five policies you want at B. But as the game goes on, you as the middle class player need to really determine what's going to help you the most. For example, if you are staffing a whole bunch of working class uh, meeples on your, uh, on your businesses and you don't have a lot of workers working uh, for the capitalist class and the state, you are going to want to have your wages low. But if you don't have any 
working class workers working for you and you have a bunch of your workers working for the capitalist class and the state, you want the labor to be uh, the labor market to be high. You want them to get paid a lot for their wages. So just consider what helps you the most at that moment and be strategic about it. Also, if bills that are proposed that are helping the working class and the capital class don't have great impact on you, think about which team is your biggest threat. So if the capitalist is the biggest threat to you in a game, well, vote against them, slow them down, help yourself win. You could, you got a lot of flexibility when it comes to the different bills that are proposed. And it, rem- it really depends on the strategies that you want to employ to help yourself out the most, as well as what are the things that are you're going to do that are going to slow down the opponents that are threatening to beat you in a given moment. So for the biggest thing with the middle class, all of what I just said uh, really comes down to become self-sufficient. So be able to build businesses early and staff them. Don't allow or do the best you can to not allow excess workers to continue to be unemployed. Get enough workers to fill your businesses so that you can produce more and that you can um, then from there uh, use the goods that you produce to increase your prosperity as the game goes along. So that would be my best recommendations for the middle class. The state player is going to introduce a different way of playing the game hegemony. Uh, The state is present when you are not using the state player faction but they are going to be there to give money to, to buy goods and services from. They're going to be very passive. The state player can be very active in their role. Additionally, now the state has a few things that they didn't have present in the game before. For example, event cards and the political agenda and state benefits are all there that are going to have uh, you know, some spice added to the game. So how do I approach the state? First of all, considering victory points, the ways that I'm going to try to go about that would be, first of all, to increase my legitimacy as much as I can. So that is the first thing in my mind is how do I increase my legitimacy uh, along with the event cards that I'll talk about in just a moment. But uh, if I can increase the legitimacy for all three of the other classes, Uh, consistently as I go through the game, I give myself the best chance to get more influence as well as to give myself more victory points for the game. Um, The other thing I'm going to consider for victory points is providing uh, different goods and services for other factions. So with that, uh, if we have our policies for the, um, the, the goods that are sold, Um, so this would be welfare and education. If I can get those to B or A, I benefit from those in terms of victory points. If it's at C, I get the benefit of more money, but here's the kicker. If those policies are at C, so the healthcare policy and the education policy, um, very rarely will someone buy from me for the cost of 10 when they can purchase from another player for cheaper. So getting it, getting that policy to, to, to where the other players are paying five uh, might be more beneficial because they'll, they'll buy from me and then I can also get victory points from that. Additionally, there are many cards that you play from your hand where you provide for other players. You take the things you provide, you put them in state benefits And when those players collect, you get victory points there as well. So just consider in the ways that you're helping other players, how can you make uh, victory points through giving them benefits, right? Um, When it comes to elections, I already mentioned the fact that I'm not trying to have C uh, where I have super expensive goods to sell because no one's going to buy them from me. And then if no one buys them, they have a maximum amount that they can store. So we end up wasting the effort of the workers uh, and the workers get paid. So 
So money comes out of the treasury and you don't recoup that money when the good is sold because they're not sold. They're just thrown away. So I want to have the prices at a place that I can sell them. So typically I'm going to try to, if someone else is trying to get the um, the policy four and five when it comes to healthcare and education. If they're trying to go to B, uh, I'll definitely go there. If they want to go to A, well, I got to think about IMF. Uh, but if I have a lot of money, I might even allow for it to go to A temporarily because I can get some more benefits from uh, the, the fact that when you sell, you get better um, extras. So uh, that would be what I would prioritize. Um, additionally, you get a political agenda card. And on that card, you're going to have uh, your priorities for that current round in terms of bills. Uh, so if I am going to benefit from a bill going to a place where I'll get a victory point that round, absolutely, I will most likely vote for it unless I look at the big board and... Um, the third thing I'm going to consider uh, on that note with the big board is if the team that is dominating the game is proposing a bill, even if it will help me, like, for example, moving policies where they will benefit me, like four and five, even if it might help me uh, because my political agenda card says that that's the policy that I'm going for. I might rather try to slow down the player who's winning and, again, play the long game. Uh, one victory point is important, but if it results in 10 extra victory points for the player who is uh, the, the, the team that is winning by a lot, then perhaps I will try to slow them down and go against them. The other thing I would generally consider is just make sure you do your event cards. Event cards are going to have good bonuses for you and they will have big time legitimacy um, decreases if you do not complete them. So uh, event cards really should be the first thing that you do because sometimes the circumstances in the game might take a, an event card that you're able to complete at the beginning and make it so you can't complete it after that. So I would want to make sure that I go after those event cards right away if I can. My first two moves uh, if I can. Now, if one of the event cards is one that I have to facilitate some action toward it happening, then you can either try to work with the other players or uh, try to use your own means to make that event card happen. Uh, it's it's definitely worth it unless it's going to take you like three rounds to make it happen when you have three other things that would be much bigger impact than that event card. You have to weigh the costs and the benefits. Apply that economics that we're trying to learn in this game, right? So focus on the event cards. Make them happen uh, as quickly as you can. And uh, if you can't do one, uh, just consider... If you can make it happen, is it worth the other moves that you're going to lose out on? And if you're going to choose to ignore an event card, just do the best you can to make awesome moves so that you can make up the difference. And then finally, beyond that for the state player, just have a very flexible attitude toward how you play. You are going to benefit as you benefit all three other players. Uh, but if you're falling behind because one player is getting uh, some good things happening to them to help them pull ahead. Uh, just use things like uh, elections and uh, various cards to maybe help other players to help yourself out or to hinder the players that are pulling ahead. So really you and your actions are gonna be dependent on what the other players are doing. So that's it for the various strategies that I have for the different uh, factions. Um, so if you have anything else that uh, you think would be good things to consider. Uh, now, obviously, there's a whole two rule books. If you have the base game and then the extended uh, Crisis and Control Edition, 
Uh, and there's also, you know, the player cards and the player aids that uh, give a lot of detail on things that you can do with each faction. But I really wanted to distill it down to three major things to consider for each one. But uh, if you've noticed other major considerations, again, drop them down in the comments. Uh, it'd be really helpful for me and other players of the game to know different things they can consider when playing the board game Hegemony. If you found this video helpful and beneficial to you, go ahead, hit the like and subscribe button. Uh, hitting the like button will get it out to other people. And thank you for your time, your consideration, and I hope you can apply some of these strategies as you play the board game Hegemony.